And I'm going to call the meeting to order at 7.03. And let's see. May I ask a board member to please take minutes of this meeting for me, since I don't think Dawn is here and she's usually our gracious volunteer. I can do the minutes. Great, thank you so much. Okay, mm -hmm. and is there any public comment? Mm -mm. I think other than the crew that's usually here, I don't see anybody else here right now, so we will move on. Okay, so I need a motion to approve our minutes. The last time we met was August 4th, which feels like a long time ago now. Mm -hmm. um, but I do need a motion from a board member to please approve the minutes from August 4th. So moved. Okay, Andrew, thank you. And a second? I'll second. And Rob, Rob. is seconding. Great, thanks. Hey, Don, Liz has offered to take minutes, so you are off the hook this evening. Awesome, thank you. Sorry, I had trouble getting connected. No problem. Okay. Okay, so we're going to start um, with a recap of how things went at the board retreat, which was, let's say we had the community, or we had the um, facilities planning committee met, and then we had the board retreat. Um, and so this is our first time getting together since both of those things. Oh, I see Kristen waiting to get in. Hang on one second. Okay, so I was not at the retreat, but I will provide a summary of what I think transpired and those board members that were there can, can jump in if I miss anything. Um, so essentially there were, we had the chance to hear some budget and enrollment projections from Patrick, um, which I've asked him to share in a little bit with the full group. Um, and we reviewed the NASDAQ report and the action that this committee needs to know about is that the board uh, confirmed that we would like to take a straw poll of the community at the end of October to help gauge what we would place on a ballot in March. And so I pulled up our, I'm going to sh share my screen for a minute because I pulled up um, our facilities timeline. Let's see if I can. Hiding. Okay, can everybody see that okay? I see some nods. Okay, so just to remind us of how we get to that October 26 no. drop hole idea. So um, in order for the board, assuming we're on this timeline of bringing a vote possibly to the community in March, then when you back up from there, we have to have a window in which to warn a vote. The board has to have a meeting to approve such warning, which is essentially when we would hear from Patrick on what he would recommend that we put up for a vote. Um, and in our November board meeting, we would want time to discuss what that might look like. So Patrick wouldn't be putting forth a recommendation without conversation with the board first. And the idea is that this November 24th board meeting um, would be informed by the work that we do with the community. So our charge is that work. And uh, the board discussed having a, a conclusion of that work um, in a straw poll where we get a sense of what the community's appetite is before we decide what we think we should put on the ballot. So with that in mind, um, between now and the end of October, we really need to start engaging with folks, uh, re-engaging really, um, about the situation we're in and spend the month of October leading up to that straw poll, connecting with people on lots of levels uh, to figure out how to really get feedback and input. And so what I'd like to do for today is three things. 
I'd like us to um, determine what we think should be included in this first communication to the community. So again, I said we're kind of re-engaging. We've, we've engaged all along. There was a summary that went out in, October, in August, letting people know what we were up to and that a NASDAQ report would be coming. That report is out. It has been discussed at um, the board and at the facilities committee, but we haven't really shared it broadly with the community. So that is probably a, chan um, a way for us to re-engage is around that report and start conversations again with people. Um, so I'd like our group to discuss what should that first communication look like um, and how do we want to share that and then begin thinking about what October might, might look like as well. So um, that's kind of how I thought we might tackle today's meeting. And you know, it comes from a recognition that, that we are, we're at the point of having to take action, that we have to make some decisions based on our budget and enrollment projections. And so, um, so we need to move forward. So I've asked Patrick if he would spend some time going over the presentation he shared with the board at the retreat on these budget projections. And I think he has a, um, a brief slide deck that he used then that I thought would be helpful. Board, some board members have seen it already. I have not because I wasn't at the retreat. Um, but I think it's useful for us to, to take a little bit of time looking at that together. Um, before we do that, I just wanted to pause and just um, check in with people to see if you have any reactions to how, how I think we should move forward tonight. So I, I think it makes sense, uh, Krista. And you know, when you're doing a process, you get information, then you process it, and then you you uh, you integrate it, and then you produce some sort of product. So I think we're we're going to get a little more information. Then we have to integrate everything that we've all the information we have to produce something, which is the charge for the vote. So. Um, we, we haven't had to integrate anything for a long time, but we're getting there and it, it's, you know, it's a different part of the process. It feels different. And, um, and, and, you know, whatever gets voted on may get voted down and that gives us information. Then we have to go back and integrate. We don't know what the outcome's going to be, but we have to put something forward. Right. Nancy, I saw your hand up. Did you want to say something? Yeah, I would just say that um, it feels tricky to respond to the timeline or the questions you're going to be asking of us tonight when only board members on the committee have seen, I think, the facilities report, unless I'm mistaken. I mean, the consultants report. Oh, that's a good point. Um, and <clears throat> and so have I'm, we, oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead, Mary. Sorry. Um, just have we, I mean, is there any solution we can come up with that's just interim because of the COVID? Like making decisions in this time seems insane, right? Because we know the budget's going to be whacked for another year or two so far down so is there anything we can do then it's just like hey we're doing this for three years just to cut costs because we have to really like is there anything like that in the possibilities or is it like we're making a decision and that's that's our decision is there any possibility to have some kind of interim solution just to hold us because it's going to be awful budget for the next year or two i'm sure that's what patrick's about to tell us because we all know that's hitting us so i think um and patrick can chime in if I'm wrong, but I think what we're going to hear from him is a projection that's beyond just this year and probably even the next year. So it gives us a sense of the longer term picture. So regardless of this particular moment in time, which has its own really unique challenges, um, a lot of the, the issues are still the same. So I think, I think this is kind of a long range plan. 
Um, and do you think there's, I guess the question would be, do we think that the, there's an appetite in the communities to be grappling with these huge decisions now when school doesn't even look like school for kids for this year? That's just a question to mull mm -hmm. over, but yeah, I think I know that, yeah. I think we should get the information from Patrick and then totally. ask those questions because it's quite a compelling um, bunch of numbers. I'm sure it's awful. <laughs> and back to the NESDAQ report piece, um, that's out there and I apologize for not having shared it before this meeting and definitely was not a deliberate, um, deliberately withheld and can easily be shared with everybody. Um, I don't think there's much in there that's new to what we've already discussed as far as our, our knowledge about enrollment projections, um, real estate configuring, um, the real estate market, um, the demographics, all of those things is really what they sort of focused on and it kind of confirms what we know about our situation. It does do a nice job of looking at the different scenarios and what the pros and cons are with each of them. Um, but there isn't a particular silver bullet there or a recommendation that I think would inform our conversation. So one thing we do need to do is figure out how to convey that to folks. And you're right, Nancy, having the report would be helpful. So that's uh, my misstep, so I apologize. But let's um, hear from Patrick first and then sort of see how we go after that. And Patrick, I don't know, do I need to give you permission to share your screen? I think I'm all set. I think I have okay. it. And, and maybe, so because a few folks haven't seen the NESDEC report, I can try to like just really, really cursory um, summarize what it told us to help contextualize the, the presentation that I'm going to show. Because we've we, we built the budget numbers, which I'll start by saying are projections on top of projections on top of projections at this time of the year. Um, but we built those using information from the NESDEC study in terms of enrollment. And I think, so from the enrollment perspective, so part of what NESDEC did was they did a demographic study, looked really in depth, as Krista said, in the real estate market, looked at birth rates, looked at all, all kinds of um, metrics to try and produce a really um, solid projection of enrollment. So looking back 20 years, we've lost about 700 students. And looking forward 10 years, they project we lose another 200 students. So in that 30 year window, looking at about a 900 student reduction, um, which obviously is really significant for a district our size. So that's the equivalent currently of the entire population of Mount Abe and Bristol Elementary School. So really, really significant student enrollment drop, which again, isn't a surprise, but their much more sophisticated look at enrollment supports what we, what we believed to be true already about that. One, one piece of information they gave was around building capacity. And they gave us information about if we continue to use buildings in the way we do now, in terms of the kinds of office space we're providing to different people, et cetera, they gave us the, the capacity of buildings. And then they told us if you, if you took over some of the classrooms that are currently office space, here's the potential um, capacity for buildings. So gave us some information about how many students our buildings could educate under a different, uh, different couple of cir circumstances, depending on what direction we wanted to go. And then they gave us some, some possible scenarios. So some of the scenarios look a lot like the scenarios that we came up with. And a few scenarios are kind of spin-offs from the scenarios that we came up with, like similar in concept, but a little different here or there. And some scenarios are, are a fair bit different, which is sort of what we were interested too in was, you know, help us see if the scenarios we think might make sense past the straight face test in your study. And if there's something we're missing that could be a possibility, we don't want to start ruling some of those things out. So I feel like to that extent, we got, we got some information, you know, they, they very clearly didn't and they were upfront in the beginning that they weren't going to recommend any scenario to us. They were going to talk about the feasibility of a few scenarios. But we did ask them to, because they're building their study, um, 
with us simultaneously as doing a study of Addison Northwest, and we had expressed interest in knowing what possibilities might exist in a relationship with Addison Northwest. Uh, we wanted to have some scenarios that that thought through that as well, and they provided that for us. So, so again, nothing earth shattering, really just solidified what we knew. And in fact, the enrollment projections they gave us for the next few years are a little worse than the enrollment projections that we were looking at. So, um, so that's effectively the information we have from NESDAQ. And, and Krista just linked the, the reports in the chat. So you can, you can see those. But the, I, I offer that as a context for what I'll share in terms of numbers and, and how that, that leads into the, to the facilities conversation. Yeah, Nancy. Um, I'm just curious about whether um, how they approached um, uh, exploring the, fe the feasibility of scenario one. I, I was hoping and expecting that they scenario one was that we keep our five elementary schools and our seven through twelve middle high school. And I, I was very hopeful that in <clears throat> in working with you, Patrick, and the administrative team, and um, and uh, and our financial office, um, that they might help uh, us think about ways we might um, keep the those that those school configurations and those grade configurations while making adjustments to I'm not sure what. Um, uh, certainly some programming, I imagine, um, so that we would have a sense of uh, what it would take programmatically as well as financially in order to keep all of our schools while we're working to increase enrollment. And so I'm curious yeah. about what you could tell us about that piece. Sure, so in, in conversations with NESDEC relatively early on um, and in working, I think with the facilities to the group as well and talking that through, it became pretty clear that there wasn't a role for NESDEC and even NESDEC said they don't really have a role in studying our current configuration because they're not, they, they were not going to tackle the financial implications. They were not going to make any recommendations about what should or shouldn't happen programmatically. That wasn't really, that's not anything they, basically they don't touch that with a 10 foot pole. They say that those are, are decisions that need to be made at the district level. And that's not really the work that they do. And even the, the financial implications, and to some extent, the programmatic implications of the scenarios that they did provide information on, uh, were left pretty wide open for us to figure out. So we, and we, again, we've known from the beginning, the, our financial office was going to be responsible for understanding the financial implications of any of the scenarios. So all of that to say, NESDEC didn't provide information on our current scenario, but that's information that we have because we're running those. And in fact, the projections that you're going to see, it doesn't, it gets a little bit into programming because we're talking about the number of personnel that would need to be reduced in order to pass budgets that are at the spending threshold. So I think it will start to lend itself toward what are the programmatic implications. It gets tricky to talk about what specific programmatic implications will be because those are decisions that would need to be made down the road in terms of what our priorities were programmatically in light of personnel reductions. And it gets, we're small enough that we can get pretty identifiable pretty quickly when we start having those conversations. So there has to be an appropriate time and place for that. And, it's, and we're not there yet. For example, if we talk about chemistry at the high school level, if we said we were cutting chemistry, we have a chemistry teacher. So we can talk about it programmatically, but we very, very quickly get to a personally identifiable impact um, to someone's job. So, so for that reason, it's, we're not there yet, but I think, again, you're gonna see if we made no change to our staffing levels and we made no change to the number of buildings we operate, you're going to see the financial projections going forward. Um, so I feel like with that information, we have it already, and NESDEC wasn't wasn't uh, able to produce something that would further <coughs> around that. 
So we don't really have an, a, a, an answer to the question, what would make scenario one feasible? And we're talking about the possibility of closing schools before we know that. No, we, we do have that because when we look at the numbers, we can see if we keep the schools open, what the um, impact on programming would be. So we do have that information. Well, you know, oh, the, the impact of, of staffing maybe, like how many, how many positions well, you would need to cut. Right, but that would also, that can also go to programming because if you cut certain staff, you have to cut certain programming. Right, but the devil's in the details and having a sense of what the programming is one would cut seems to be important information, especially if you're asking the question, what would make this feasible? Right, and I know we had a discussion at the retreat, would we rather um, cut programming or buildings? And so that's really what it's gonna come down to when we get these numbers, would we rather cut programming or or um, facilities. I think that's what Patrick's presentation will boil down to. And, and, and I, I think, think we all, sorry, go ahead, Andrew. Well, the other thing we were talking about, the, the board retreat was also talking to the community. I don't know if we'll do this or not, but that, well, if you want to keep things as status quo, then here's the price tag for that. You want to keep all schools and you want to keep all staff with uh, the enrollment projections dropping another 200 this is what is going to happen uh, at an equalized per pupil cost uh, over the spending threshold. And if you are interested in paying that plus the tax penalty, and that's the will of the voter, then that's you know an option too. I, I just want to remind us all that we very specifically called keeping our schools and our grade configurations scenario one not status quo because we were recognizing that it was quite possible that if that was going to be feasible some changes would need to be made within our staffing configurations and 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 other things so status quo to me means keeping everything the same and that is not what scenario one was intended. I, I don't have scenario one in front of me, but I'm just generally speaking that the idea was if we wanted to keep staffing in schools open, we would have to tell the taxpayer this is what is going to cost and then there might be some variations on what that looked like. And I think part of, and, and again, I think for me, it's hard to start talking now about what specifically would the programmatic impact be? Like how, how could we say right now the impact is going to be no more art or less art or no more athletics at the high school or no more music or no like how do we i don't know how we start that conversation now because we can't possibly know that yet and we're going to be trying to mitigate those as we go along and and that takes us down a different path right now than i think we're ready to go and i think part of part of the anxiety that's growing inside for me is the i personally feel like the longer we we try to pretend this isn't going to happen, the more it's going to have, like, so we have an opportunity to either be the architects of our change or just let change happen to us. And the longer we, we try to, to convince ourselves it's not real, the greater the likelihood that it happens to us as opposed to being in a position to be the architects. Uh, and I think, and, and maybe this is a good segue into the numbers. I think the numbers help help us see what we're really facing in the coming years, um, and hopefully puts us into a disposition toward action, so that we can move to a place of community engagement, um, and and not having anyone feel like they're kind of blindsided by some big ask on town meeting day. So with that, I'll, I'll start sharing my screen. Oh, host disabled participant screen sharing. Sorry, Krista, I do need some permissions.
Okay, I made you the host, so you should be able to share now. Perfect, thank you. All right. So this is a portion of the, the presentation. So this is where we start, sort of start in with the, um, with the financial context. And really this was looking at numbers, again, really, really preliminary numbers to help set the context for the conversations around facilities and how many facilities we operate, et cetera. And so what you can see here, I'm gonna minimize this for a minute, okay. Um, what this shows, and again, just for context, this assumes we keep our current staffing level and our current buildings open, kind of keep everything um, as is in terms of those, those factors. And assumes a lot of different things about what's gonna happen with our spending over the years, et cetera. This does use the enrollment projections given by NASDAQ. Now they didn't give us equalized pupil projections, but we plugged their enrollment projections into the formulas that we use to make those equalized pupil projections. So they're, they're as good as we can have right now. And obviously what you can see to our spending is spending goes up over the years. And you'll see FY 22, 23, and 24, and then it kind of skips to 30. So NASDAQ gave us enrollment figures out to FY 30. And we thought just for sort of a, a sake of perspective, to play numbers out that far to give you a sense of where we're headed long term if we don't make some decisions in the short term. And we kept, we kept the projected revenue flat because it's really hard to anticipate what's going to happen there. There are a lot of moving pieces. I should also articulate that this does not account for any COVID related financial impact because we don't know exactly what that's going to be or how that's going to be uh, factored into budget building. This also does not account for the waiting study, which could have a significant impact on us. It doesn't count for Act 173, which could have a, an impact on us. So there are, there are a few other pretty significant moving parts out there that is really hard to know where they're gonna land or when they're gonna land right now. So we, we know they're out there, but we didn't try to build those in because it's too much of an unknown. And so then you can see our, our projected ed spending, which is the difference between our spending and our revenue divided by our projected equalized pupils, gives us a cost per equalized pupil. And then, you know, just looking at what has happened historically with the spending threshold, we use that historical data to make some projections about what the spending threshold might be going forward. And we looked at the relationship between what our spending is, what the allowed spending is on the projected spending threshold, and total that out to how many dollars over that spending threshold would we be? So as you can see right now for FY22, we're projecting to be $1.2 million over the spending threshold. Now to Andrew's point earlier in this scenario, if, if we went to the voters and, and we said, like, let's say if this in the straw poll, the voters said, we wanna keep everything the way it is. We wanna keep the staff that we have, the programs that we have, the buildings that we have, et cetera, then what we would be asking, and again, it's a projection, but we would be asking the voters to spend $1.2 million more than what's allowed. And that means that would incur a $1.2 million penalty in taxes. So that's obviously a pretty significant um, ask of the voters. I should also really clarify, this does anticipate um, using the information we had at the time a loss of students to home study programs. Um, and there's some possibility that the legislature will forgive some of that. So this 1.2 million may reduce down to closer to maybe a million dollars, um, but still a significant number based on these projections at this point. And then you can see again, if we made no change after FY22 and FY23, the number grows and grows and grows. Um, so that's, that's pretty significant. And when we advance through the slides, 
This talks a little bit about the assumptions. So we talked about the NESDAQ enrollment projections that we used. Um, this assumes a 15% premium increase for health insurance, a 3% increase in salaries, revenues flat, as I said, doesn't account for those, those factors of COVID, the waiting study, 173. As I mentioned, it assumes the 19 students that, have un that we were anticipating unenrolling for FY21. I think that number is actually a little bit higher right now than 19. Um, and of course, we're estimating what the spending threshold is. So when, if we're looking at these from a straight personnel standpoint, again, so 70 something percent of our budget, somewhere in the neighborhood of 75% of our budget is personnel related costs. So look, if all of the savings came from personnel, so if we're not gonna save anything from buildings and, and it's all in the personnel, then you can see for FY22, we would have to cut nine building administrators at their total compensation on average, um, 13 professional educators or 21 support staff. So this, again, the entire 1.2 is achieved through the nine building administrators. The entire 1.2 million is achieved through the 13 professional educators and the entire 1.2 is achieved through 21 support staff. So that's not adding those together. It's uh, looking at those in their entirety. So as you start to look at what this means over time, like this is, it's a large number of staff members. And we're at a point with the reductions we've made over the years that we, we're getting to the place where we can't really cut staff members significantly more and not begin to have an impact on programming. Um, and that, that's the unfortunate reality. And so if we, the, and I guess the fortunate reality is, and because not all districts are in this position, I suppose, the fortunate reality is we have some options. They may not be great options, but we have options that can help mitigate the impact on programming. And some of it's going to come down to our priorities. Like I don't, I don't think we can, based on these numbers, as you're seeing them, and as I've, I'm coming to, to sort of grapple with them myself, we're not going to be able to keep programming, keep all buildings open, and keep taxes under the spending threshold. Uh, we can do any two of those three things, but I don't see a path that allows us to do all three. And so if we choose, if we choose programming, and I think many people would agree that programming is critical in terms of achieving our ends, then either we need, we need the taxpayers to support spending above the spending threshold, or we have to consolidate where our students go and therefore where we have our staff to create efficiencies to enable us to maintain or even expand programming. And I think, and this just sort of further sets the context. So if the savings needed came from buildings and personnel, that's fewer staff reductions that we would need. Fewer reductions and increased efficiency means that we can maintain or increase programming. And for example, if we repurpose two schools, even for FY22, that could produce sufficient enough savings that we could get under the spending threshold for FY22, maintain our current programming, and actually expand in the area of health and ensure that all elementary students receive health education, which they don't currently receive. So that's one example of um, a, a reconfiguration of our schools that we create efficiency that has us maintaining and even expanding programming while making the reductions that we need to get an FY22 budget that is at the spending threshold. And I want to articulate again that those numbers that you saw before, the red that were showing how much money we needed to save, that gets us to the spending threshold, not under the spending threshold. And then we jumped into the facility study after that. But that hopefully sets the context for the kind of money that we're talking about. And you know, Kim, you mentioned earlier, actually maybe it wasn't Kim, 
um, I think it was Mary. Like, can we can we wait a few years? And so for me, you can see here the impact of waiting a few years. So three years from now, if we don't do make some of these hard decisions, the default is we're cutting programming or we're asking taxpayers to spend crazy amounts of money in tax penalties, which they probably don't go for. So while I wish that was something we could wait on because of everything going on with COVID, I don't think that's a, a I don't think that's a reality for us. I don't think that's uh, something we can do. I just want to clarify. <clears throat> it was more that if we could say, hey, we have to, just like you just said, hey, for this next two years, because we're, you know, like if we like, we're going to close two schools, if maybe we could do it in like that kind of framing. I don't know if that, that sounds disingenuous anyhow, but I didn't know if that would be easier for people to conceive. If it was like an interim plan, we're gonna have some feedback loops, evaluate whether that makes sense or something like that, just so it's not just this is what we're doing forever and done. Yeah, so I did not say delay, deny, you know, yeah. Gotcha, I misunderstood that, sorry. Yeah, sorry, I didn't communicate well. So I can stop my sharing so we can see everyone and yeah. happy to go through or I can share again if need be. Patrick, do you, you know off the top of your head how many professional staff we currently employ? We are, I think we're in the neighborhood of 150. We have about 320, I think, total staff. Uh, and I think a little less than half of that are, are professional staff. I'm just thinking about your slides of how many folks you would have to cut in order to achieve, to, to get us the spending threshold. So. 86 folks out of 150 or so would mean more than 50% of our staff. It, it sounds to me like it would be a, a non a non viable institution at that point. Yeah, and that's the and you know it gets these numbers are, are for conversation purposes at this point as we're getting further and further out because like let's say we did reduce the the 1.2 million for FY22 and it came through staffing, that then reduces the following year number by that 1.2 million. So, um, it, you know, we have to sort of, and it actually saves a little bit more than that 1.2 million the following year because of the increase in compensation and benefits and all those sorts of things. Um, yeah. So I, I don't know that it would equate at the end of the day in 10 years from now to that number of people but that was an attempt to try and conceptualize how many people that would be. Um, but it, nevertheless, we, and I don't want to pretend that closing schools would mean we don't have to reduce lots of staff. It doesn't change the fact that 75% plus or minus of our budget is staffing related costs. If we're talking about needing to save millions of dollars, the lion's share of that millions of dollars is gonna come from staffing. We can cut staffing while keeping all buildings open and that has a significant impact on programming because we didn't create efficiencies in our use of staff. If we close buildings, we create efficiencies that enable us to make staffing reductions that don't impact programming or impact programming far less or the ideal, and I think this is a real possibility based on my cursory look at things, increase programming while getting our budget where it needs to be. But it's at a cost, and I don't, I don't agree that it's at a cost when we're talking about closing schools. Uh, I just think the reality is no matter what we do, there's a cost, and we have to determine what that cost is. And the longer we don't decide the more the decisions being made for us because not deciding is deciding something. And basically not deciding is choosing cut program. So I, I want to um, give everyone a chance to kind of, you know, sit with this a little bit, think about it. And um, some of us process quickly and some of us process a little more slowly. And so um, I wanna make sure that everyone has it has the space to, to to react to all this information recognizing that um, you know we won't we won't have enough time to fully do all that 
this evening, but what makes sense to me is to just, if you want to raise your hand and I'll call on folks and then make sure that, you know, we haven't missed anybody who wants to say something. Go ahead, Nancy. Um, you, you may not be able to, you may not have done this yet or been, be able to do this tonight, but when I look at those numbers in red, um, I'm wondering about how, how going over the threshold affects people dollar wise that, you know, you know how we try to show people what any budget will do based on a, a, a particular um, assessment of your house and so forth. I'm, I'm just curious about what that looks like uh, and wondering whether it's important to try to portray that whenever we show those numbers, those red numbers. And if I can just jump in and say that, um, I'm gonna start writing down as people have those questions because I think they'll help us flesh out what we wanna be sure that we try to capture for people when we share this back out. So instead of um, trying to answer it right now, I think that's a great thing to, to try to provide to people. I think we, we've, we try to break down dollars and cents in different ways. So, um, so sort of that's what, okay. it, what, it, what it means in terms of dollars and what it means in terms of tax rates is, is one piece of it, but people need to see that in terms of actual dollars, dollar increases over say the current year. And I think we've been doing that for um, budgets for the last couple of years anyway. So we already, we already do that. So yeah, I think we would continue to do that for this. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and we have that. I'm trying to find it. Um, I, may be, I may be able to put my hands on it, but I, I don't want to promise that. I can't tell Mary, is that a tentative finger or a full it was a tentative. hand? <laughs> but I guess I'm already at the place now where it's like, okay, now we need vision, right? So now it's like, okay, if this is just, if it's, if it's this dire and, you know, we need to know that the values that the community has said, how are we going to make those a reality given you know, the situation like, hey, we have to close some schools down, but this is what we can do programmatically. This is how we can respond to social and emotional kids. This is how we can flexible, you know, like, the, you know, da, da, da. you know what I'm trying to say, I think. I think the challenge with that, because I've been thinking some about the community values and, and I think we looked at a tool that, um, that Sue offered us to sort of assess those values on the different scenarios. I think the challenge for me is I don't think there's a scenario that equally honors all of those values. Different scenarios honor different values over others. And I don't think we have clarity right now of what the prioritized list of community values are, which makes it then really tricky to choose a scenario that's most in line with what the community says are its priorities. Well, if we, if we, um, jump ahead to what I'm hoping we'll do, well not jump ahead, but in a little bit, I'm hoping we will talk about this re-engagement with the community and that that may be a part of it, is revisit those values. What's the pulse now? And um, yeah, get some more clarity in as inclusive a way as possible. And drawing out, because my problem with like, I, I love what Sue had us all do, but it wasn't, it was a little too airy still for me, the values. Like if we could say, hey, this is how we're going to prioritize SEL. Like this is what we're going to implement. And I know that strategic plan, we're doing that. But then if we could just draw that out for people so it's not just these airy, bold things, if that makes sense. When we do, it, yeah. And Krista, I know you made me host. I'm not sure if you can see this, but Ian Albinson's in the waiting room. I don't know if you want me to admit him. You're muted, was that, I think I read yes. <laughs> yes, thank you. Okay. 
Hi, Ian. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Sorry, I'm late. That's okay. So we just heard a little bit from Patrick on some budget and enrollment projections and we're kind of mulling that over a little bit. Um, I saw Kim, your hand up. Oh, sorry, Patrick, were you going to say anything though to that? Um, okay, so duly noted, I think Mary, that where, where possible, if we can try to really be more specific for folks on what does it mean if we say we are going to value social and emotional health? What, what, what does that look like? And, and I think to that point, as, as Mary was saying, we, we have a pretty narrow window in which to get down to some really concrete, um, I don't want to say necessarily decisions, but we need some concrete information. We need to share some concrete information with the community. We need to receive some concrete information from the community or make informed decisions and to help me make an informed recommendation to the board. Um, realistically, probably you know, November or December, I feel like I'm, I'm expected to make a recommendation to the board about how to move this forward and what scenario, because they're gonna need time to weigh it and talk it through and they have to act at their board meeting in January. So I can't just show it to the board in January and say, you need to decide tonight. There's, there's a process that they need to engage in. So the, the timeline's ticking and again, missing the window of January for the board to decide what to warn means we're, we're punting another year and you now see the financial impact and the potential programmatic impact of doing so. Kim, I saw your hand up before. Did you want to say something? Yeah, I've got a couple of things. One is um, that uh, just to get back to this idea um, that Mary laid out at the beginning um, and I know that that Middlebury I think there's some people that are that are doing another petition about delaying facilities um, decisions and planning and from from my perspective and what I'm saying is it, it's just creating more angst I mean there's a lot of angst already and the the response from the board I think was not yeah, it was like too bad. We're just moving forward. And so I think, um, you know, I think it's just really important that we have the hard conversation like Patrick is saying. And Patrick, you did a really nice job of laying out um, the urgency of it you, you have all along. I think in the fall when we had the community meeting, um, you know, you continue to, to in a very nice way say, you, you know, here's, here's the reality of it. And I think that that has to be that's that has to be the next communication step to the community is a reinforcement of where we are financially and the urgency around moving forward with making decisions and laying out a timeline, um, depending on what we talk about tonight, but laying out that timeline literally, which is only a month and a half um, between now and the end of October. So, um, so laying out with the numbers um, gets the conversation going for everybody in all the towns. And I, I'll, I'll wait until we get a little further along tonight, um, but some ideas about engaging the communities and then how do we go about doing that. But, and I agree with Mary, I think um, Sue's work was great, but, but you know, I think a lot of people were coming to those first meetings in each of our towns at the elementary schools to talk about what happens if we close our elementary schools and we talked about how great our elementary schools are and um, that's one of our community values that's one of the things everybody decided is that we don't want to close elementary schools but you know I think it's becoming pretty clear from what I'm seeing in my quick cursory look at the um, NASDAQ report that it's likely that that's what we're going to have to do so so I think we've got to bring we got to bring all those parts and pieces together and um, and uh, and laying out the the uh, kind of distressful situation financially that the district is in will help to spur people to those next you know the next conversations. Go ahead, Nancy. I was just looking back at the facilities committee's charge and um, and the questions that are part of that 
charge kind of essential questions. And um, one of those questions is about what, the, what does the research say about the effects of closing schools on communities? And I wonder if the facilities committee has explored that research. So the, the next meeting, the facilities committee is gonna start digging into those questions, those 18 questions. I started doing some of that research. I reached out to superintendents that had been involved in school closures and actually talked to one superintendent that did his, at least started his dissertation on, uh, on that work. And so he has shared with me some of his study and his, his resources through that dissertation. So, and, and in conversation with him, he said, the, the reality is the impact on small communities is different for every community. There isn't a blanket, this is the impact to any small community that closes its school. Um, he said a lot of it has to do with what, so as we think about the role of a school in the fabric of the community, um, we have to also look at what other aspects of the community um, are there to pick up what might be lost if the school wasn't present. Towns have different, um, different other qualities that either position them better or worse to make up for the loss that a school might, might bring. Um, and so it, it's really just different in each town, but those are factors that need to be considered as we understand the impact. Um, and honestly, like that's gonna be the tricky thing for me no doubt there's an impact to any town that loses a community school. The impact will be different. And I feel, I feel torn, so as I think about my role as superintendent, and I feel like that's the hat I need to wear throughout this process, because that's the job that I'm, I'm charged with. I'm not sure my job as superintendent is to first look out for the, the town as a whole. I feel like my charge is I need to look out for what's best for the students in the district from an educational perspective, because I feel like that's the hat I wear as superintendent. I need to be aware of those other things. Um, but my charge is to achieve the ends for our students. And I have to keep that in mind as I, as I weigh ultimately what recommendation I make to the board. Do people feel like um, we might be ready to look a little bit more at the next communication we put out? Okay, I will make sure we have a little bit of time at the end of the meeting to revisit this. And again, just knowing that this is a, you know, an ongoing conversation for all of us in our own brains. <laughs> families, communities, all of that. Um, but thinking about what, what I hoped we could, we could tackle today. Um, so as Nancy brought up at the beginning of the meeting, the Nesbeck report has not been shared broadly yet. And we want to do that um, because we said we would, because it's out there in some small capacity, um, but also recognizing that it isn't, it isn't like the answer to everything. It has a context to it. Um, and it is a way to re-engage with folks around this work and maybe provide some other context as well. And so I just love um, to talk a little bit about what we think would be really important to share out with the community. Um, I was thinking about timing and um, to, to the point of people's capacity to digest much more right now. Um, I think it's prudent to let people settle into school and have at least a week or two of school under their belts. Um, what I think is great is that even though this group hasn't been working on communicating with people around the back to school piece, that work is happening in a pretty robust way from the district. And so there is lots of engagement happening. It's just very school specific. It's not long-term planning specific, but I, think if we um, allow things to settle a little bit as much as they're going to settle. If we look at, say, the week of September 21st to get information out to people, that gives us 
another chance to connect to kind of firm up what it is we want to say and how we're going to say it and in what avenues um, and then get it out there that week. Um, we recognize that again that the um, people may be wondering about the report and if folks ask individually for us to share that out we're happy to do that um, but we'd like to, to pair it with some more information and for the broader community. So some things that I think you know, the board's been thinking about and, and we've already touched on a little bit um, today are to revisit those core values um, and get people's folks, a pulse of people's feelings about them. Perhaps if we could flesh them out a little bit more and be more specific, that would be really helpful. Um, to remind people of our timeline, what we're doing and why. Um, to share what we learned from the NESDEC report to share some of these numbers that we heard from Patrick. So why do we need to act now? Um, and to let people know that we have a plan for talking with them more about this in the month of October. So that, that's kind of a, a rough outline of some of the things I was thinking of. Um, what do people think? What reactions do you have to that? Go ahead, Nancy. I think it would be important to include a copy of the of the facilities committee's charge. Mm -hmm. um, is the facilities committee going to make a recommendation? Is that is that part of their charge, or is it to collect just collect the information and share it out? Uh, the charge of the facilities committee, as it was given to them by the board, was to assist me in making a recommendation to the board. So they're sort of an advisory group to me, as I have to, you know, I have the charge of bringing a recommendation forward. Okay. So they're off the hook on the political part when it comes to actually landing somewhere to propose something which comes obviously with great risk so it's good for them a little tricky for me i wonder too um just again taking a quick cursory look at that report um if there's a way to um make it a little more readable and understandable for the community um it you know i think some of the pros and the cons you know, they just sort of carry over from scenario to scenario and closing a school, a community losing a school, you, you know, they all seem equally weighted and there's just got to be some way and maybe they become considerations um, as opposed to cons. So just another way to sort of look at presenting the information to the community so it's more absorbable, absorbable, is that a word? People can absorb it better and um, <laughs> and uh that we can get discussion going because we want our we want our community to be talking about it be aware of it and not feel like they're blindsided by a decision that gets made and that ultimately in my mind is one of the most important pieces of the community engagement around this is that people as many people as possible in the community all of our communities um <laughs> Are, are really aware of what's happening. Um, and that's gonna help when a vote, vote is put before um, everybody on town meeting day, it's gonna help all along the way. So, um, and I think this, I think the school board and I think this committee has done a really good job of including the community and um, getting feedback. And we just, we have to make sure that we make any information that we're sharing as understandable. Even equalized pupils, I, I, I know there's a lot of people that don't understand what that means. So we just have to look at a way of presenting the information for as many people in the five towns as we can. I think the really positive thing is that last year we came up with some of those sort of templates for doing the budget. And um, certainly there'll be more information regarding this, but, um, this is like explaining per um, equalized pupils. Patrick did that last year in the budget. So we don't have to reinvent the wheel to, to do this presentation. We've got a lot of those pieces already. 
and yeah, we need to add other pieces and it's more, more complex and so, well, I don't know, it's a different kind of complexity, but so we're not having to reinvent the wheel. We've got a lot of that um, available. And a couple of other pieces I want to offer is that, you know, the NASDAQ who con conducted the study are willing to be part of some community engagement. So if there's a role for them, they'd probably have to be doing it remotely, but I'm assuming we'd be doing our engagement remotely anyway. Um, so we can, we can keep that in mind as we're thinking about how do we engage the community and provide information. But I also want to just offer, I agree, the board has done a wonderful job to date in engaging the community in a really meaningful way. And nothing has happened in a few months and COVID has been consuming everyone. So despite all of that, this could come, it could, it could feel like this is coming out of left field. It can all of a sudden, it can feel rushed. All those things I think could still be genuine feelings from people that we need to just understand and, and be planful about um, despite all the efforts so far. I find that if you tell people I've got, we've got some um, difficult things to share, or we've got some things that might surprise you. If you, if you do say some of those things up front, that can help people a little bit. Just say, we know that, you know, we're presenting this and it's, it's hard information and we have to make some hard decisions. So I mean, it's kind of preempting it with that. Go ahead, Ian. I would say, you know, as Patrick said, the, the, the messaging hasn't been out there in the last few months, obviously because of what's happening. Um, so a refresher on that, but I would say that, and I've said this, you know, for a while now, it, it's you're, the message has to be much simpler. You know, you can, you can try to explain the equalized pupils and all the other sort of details that you have to explain and have to know about. And for some people that's going to be fine, but I think for the, for the majority of people, it's going to be too much. Um, and a lot of it is just going to be the sort of the bottom line in terms of either the, the, in some cases, more, more depressing and more sort of heartbreaking news in certain areas, or it's just going to be uh, the bottom line in terms of money, in terms of what actually could be afforded at, for a particular household or for a particular voter. Um, and so, you know, and I, I talked to Patrick about this a couple of years ago when sort of that, that third bond vote, I think, was going through in terms of how do we get that message uh, simpler where you can break it down, um, where it becomes something that's much more manageable uh, to people understanding. And I think if you do that, if you start to build uh, engagement that way, then and, and keep it consistent, then that's how you reach more people, you know, and if you make it interesting, and, and make it a, 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 you know, do sort of short story kind of stuff about why these things are happening and what the potential impacts and potential costs would be. That's a way to sort of get more people interested and get, at least get them understanding in, in a simplistic way. And then hopefully that builds momentum in terms of people sharing that and passing that along. Because, you know, you're always, as, as we all know, in, in all of these different areas, whether it's the school, whether it's the select board, whether it's planning commission, you know, it's very hard. We try our best to reach as many people as possible, but you know, that seems like, you know, an impossible task to do, but I do think, you know, concise, clear messaging um, and simplistic messaging is going to be a big, big driving factor in terms of getting people, at least so they understand when they're at making their vote and, and either saying yes or no for these things, at least they have a sort of a, a, a basic understanding of what they're doing as opposed to not having any information at all, or just saying no, because that's just an automatic thing that you might do because of money change. So that's, that's a couple of ideas and thoughts. And I've been thinking about that conversation for these past two years, Ian, and trying to think about like, the idea that we talked about these, almost like the short stories, the sketches that really simplify things, um, I think would be a really effective strategy and have been looking for an opportunity for that to have a place. And I, I feel like this could be that opportunity. Yeah, and I think so too. And I'm, you know, my wife and I, we're designers and we do this for a living. We do, we work with um, book publishers to do book trailers for kids' books. 
Um, that's that's what we do. And so the last few years, that's what our main focus has been. But we have, we've also done informational videos uh, and explainer videos, which is kind of what this is, or like you've seen the sort of the whiteboard style. Um, you know, so it could come in many different forms. The, the main thing that we'd, if if to to start to to work on this and to sort of put together some concepts would just be a script. And so you you you're telling that story, and and it's obviously a complex story. So breaking it down into smaller chunks to be able to explain the various things that are happening, um, I think, is a good good place to start. Uh, so you know, break it comp you know, break it down into different sections in the areas that you want to want to tell people about, and then write that script. And from the script, that's going to generate, you know, any kind of imagery that we want. You can do voiceover, you can, you know, and our focus is mainly animation. So we're doing 2D or 3D animation. So we, you, we can create all the imagery. Um, we can use, create graphs and, and make it animated and make it interesting. Um, but everything is driven by that, that story that you're telling. Um, and I think that would be the thing that's going to get people interested, get people hopefully sharing it, um, and at least being able to watch it and understand. Uh, and then you have a, you can design it too. So you have a habit where perhaps the graphics that, that Ray and I create for videos could be repurposed. So they have a video that you could put on Facebook, you could put it on Twitter, you could put it on Instagram, different, you know, we often work in different ratios to, to accommodate those different platforms. And that could also drive a more uh, a paper print campaign too, certain graphics that are again simplistic that you can put out there, um, and maybe it's something you know. Oftentimes you you've sent out the that single piece of uh, printout that has a lot of graphs and details on it, which is even for myself and I have a fairly decent understanding of this. It's still way too overwhelming. So you need to sort of just like take parts of that and be able to send it out, um, and it's it'll add to your budget. You know you'll have to you'll have to accommodate that. But I think it's something where if people are getting more information about it in these smaller areas, that at least allows them to sort of digest and, and to start thinking about these things in a bigger picture. And again, it's all, everything we do is based on a story, telling a story, what are we telling? Um, and that's the thing that keeps people interested or, or at least engages people. So I have a quick question about that. Is that something that we do at the get-go? Um, you know, I'm thinking back about my the, the the idea of getting something out sooner rather than later to reboot the conversation with folks. And um, so my first question is, where would that this vehicle, which I think sounds really exciting as a possible option, um, where does that fit in? Um, is that all along? Is that at the beginning of the, or in the middle? Or you know, could um, I? I had, I had a thought too. Is that the community is very um, in touch with Patrick now with his weekly videos um, and the drone. Everyone loves the drone. Um, so, I mean, I, I don't think we need to, we need to not be spending a whole lot of money to present stuff to the community. I mean, I think Patrick's been a very effective communicator and people are um, enjoy watching the videos every week and find them very informative and very uh, down to earth and very, um, it's a great way to communicate. So could we build on that? Um, and that, I don't know how much that costs, especially the drone, but um, is that is that Andrew Lester doing the drone, by the way? Oh, shoot, we thought it was Andrew. Anyway, um, so, uh, so I would say that Patrick is already doing a huge amount of community. I mean, I don't know how many hits you get on that every week. How many people are watching those, Patrick? I haven't actually stopped to look at that, to tell you the truth. I just well, keep moving. <laughs> just anecdotally, it's it's everybody that I know, and and everyone really appreciates it. It makes them feel more at ease. So we've already got a vehicle that's working, and I don't know. Um, again, I don't want to spend a lot of money on presenting stuff to people. I I think right now we don't need to be spending money when we don't need to be spending money. So I mean, it sounds lovely and awesome, and in in another space. Um, spending money on that might make sense, but right now I think we need to be very frugal. So anyway, those are my thoughts. Can we go back to that just quick question of whatever modality we use um, to engage in people, um, if we were to do something video oriented, is that a beginning part like is this our next thing or is it 
Um, and, and I'm asking also because I'm thinking, what I'd love from this group is to really focus on what's the message and how do we make sure and, and you know, make sure we're hitting all the big themes, but perhaps there's a, a smaller group of people who want to help figure out um, this, these, the pieces of that. Um, I know Kim's helped write press releases and made a media calendar and different people have helped with scripts and different roles. And so instead of getting into the detail right now, I'm just wondering timing wise where this would fit and then should we think about a smaller group of folks who really want to get into the details to, to get together to work on that? The phrase early and often comes to mind for me in okay. terms of communicating this information out in a really simple and clear way. Yep. And if we started yesterday, I don't think it would be too soon because yep. we want people to be informed by the end of October. So when we do the right. straw poll, they're offering information in an informed way to that straw poll. Mm -hmm. so, the reality is we have less than two months. I think it might've been Kim that said it's really a month and a half that we have to do this. So I do think there's a sense of urgency in getting information out there in a really understandable way. And I was almost hearing a, a potential action step, whether it's, whether we, we hire Ian and his wife to help do this or we do it on our own, we still need to tell the story. We need to write the script however it's gonna be delivered. I'm, I'm of the opinion like this, this is among the biggest decisions any of us will ever make in our work with MAUSD or ANESU. I don't think this is the time that we look to save money in how we communicate this information out on such monumental um, a, a decision. So I'd rather, if we feel great about being able to do it without spending money, fine. If we feel like, boy, it would be quite a bit better or even somewhat better if we hired a professional to help get this message out, I think it's worth that kind of, um, that kind of an investment for such a big decision. And, and I think we can, we can make it work. You know, um, it would probably come out of the facilities money that we have to put into the buildings. And that's okay. This is, this is a big deal. Also to Kristen, speaking to the money side of things, I, I'm not speaking in terms of <clears throat> in your budget is for, it would be for Ray and I, like I'd be, we'd be happy to work on it pro bono just because we're part of this town. I have two kids who hopefully will go to schools that will be here. And so I'm not, I'm far less concerned about compensation for myself. It was more sort of, you would just need to get it out there, especially if doing print things like that. Um, and so if you're sending out multiple mailers, that's, that's what I spoke of in terms of budget. It wasn't something hiring me. Like, I don't, I don't look at it that way. You know, I volunteered, you know, two years ago to do this and sort of help do this because I knew that to me, the messaging wasn't clear just because it is such a complex thing. Um, and to speak to Krista's um, question, I do think you start it now. I think you, you have a time where you've had this, this, this uh, time period go by where you haven't heard much from the, the engagement committee. Uh, or you've joined some meetings, but you haven't seen a lot, you know, going on. I do like the videos that, that Patrick's been doing. I think they're great. Um, I think those, those kind of videos only can go so far with the explanation of what's going to happen. You can do updates um, about certain things, but if you want a concise 30 second or minute long piece, it is something that has to be scripted. And it usually works better, at least in my experience, if you're doing something like this, to have sort of informational graphics and animation to it, and have a voiceover versus having someone on screen. I think you, as good as you can be in terms of a, a, a presenter, whether it's a professional or whether it's somebody else, there's something to be said to have something that doesn't have a face to it that is just explaining certain things. Again, and that all depends on the story that you're telling. Um, but I do think that I would, I would do it sooner rather than later. And if, and if you can come up with the story, we can come up with some concepts for it, um, then at least you've got a jumping off point. And then from there you can grow and you can create things that sort of move along and, and work with that as you get to, to you know, the, the inevitable conclusion, which I guess is, is town meeting day. And I don't know if you have, if you folks have the question that people are gonna be answering on that, on that day yet, um, because that's the thing that you'd have to decide. Everything goes backwards from there, as you know, as you've already worked out, um, and whether you have that answer yet, or whether you have that that pose that question, I don't know if that's if that's there yet. 
I think we'd be working backwards from a series of questions, mm -hmm. the straw poll first. From the straw poll, then we'd probably have a sense of what direction the board would go in terms of the ask in on town meeting day, and we would have sort of a separate campaign to work backwards from there is sort of how I envision that. And I just thought Morgan Freeman would be a great voiceover for this. Who can debate? Like he's just so clear, <laughs> visible. Or I think Hanks. actually, I think I think Patrick, you're fine, and that's what I propose <laughs> because I, I I remember when you did the when you presented to the select board. I was in the audience when you presented for that the um, the bond vote. I think for the third, or maybe it was the second time. And from that was when I approached you soon after that because it was like, oh, you'd be perfect. Like let's record you and let's try to do something where you can this can be explained because you explained it very well and you have a very good speaking voice. And so that was a, that was this whole whole impetus of me sort of being involved in this because it was like, well, this is I understood it very clearly, and everyone else seems to be very confused by this. And I thought, well, let's just take your presentation and put it, make it interesting, and make it visual, just so we can get it out there. So I think you're you're fine with doing it. Like we have the voiceover, we have the voice, and you are the voice, and have been especially with these videos. So now we just need to write that script and then figure out the imagery that you put along with it. And the imagery can be anything in terms of you know if you're explaining uh complex things you're having interactive you know diagrams and graphs you can have photographs we can have have anything we want and you can also have live action too i'm not trying to take a live action part out of it it all it all depends on what what particular story you're trying to tell for a particular video yeah and i also think um the process of writing that script will be very telling and will zero in our inquiry and the questions that we're needing to to get answers for and um and you know i agree that we don't want to spend a bunch of money but i think at the board retreat we did pretty much reach consensus that we were willing to spend what it takes whether it be mail whatever media it takes to, to communicate these questions that are in front of our community that that we need answers to because as patrick uh clearly articulates even an indecision is a decision um, as far as funding goes and then I think it just calls into the question of like efficiency ver versus uh, whether effectiveness. And I mean, I think right now we need to effectively communicate to our community given our constraints and, um, and the impact of, of all the decisions that, that our community is being asked to make. So do we wanna move the date up to the 14th from the 21st? I think we do need to give people a little bit of time. Um, do we want to move that up? I don't know, is that too soon? <laughs> yeah, it might be. I mean, that's the week after school starts, right? If it's also, I guess, a matter of um, how much time it would take to put something like this together. And, and, um, and also, if people think it makes sense for a smaller group of this group to do that with Patrick and Ian. Um, I see a couple I'm, of hands. Yeah, uh, Kim. And then I'm sorry. Mary. I'm just. I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure what the straw poll is. So there's just some some information missing. Is the, is the straw poll going to ask people to to select one of the options that the Nasdaq report? So show? what what we had talked about the straw poll being is asking people. I think this is right. Would they want to give the board the power to close schools or would they want to, is it, am I, am I ahead of the game or would they want to keep the power with um, towns to close schools? And what about repurposing schools? Was that this straw poll or is, am I ahead of that? I think as I recall it, it was those two things. So basically they're, Again, because there are a number of different directions we can go, trying to get a sense from the community what, where might there be appetite for any one of these directions? What, what appetite does the community have to close their school? What appetite does the community have to repurpose their school? What appetite does the community have to pay tax penalties? What appetite does the community have to cut programming? And what appetite does the community have to delegate authority for closing a school to the school board. So that's, that's five things that I recall the conversation kind of surfacing around, but others of you were there. I don't know if you're remembering something different. 
So are you asking each community to answer those questions and you're going to look at them community by community? I think where the board landed was basically to charge this committee with figuring out how to articulate those questions for each community. That's, that's that was my takeaway. Yeah, that was my takeaway as well that we would ask like just to sorry redundantly restate what Patrick just said, but we would ask each community, uh, what is your interest in closing your, your community school? Would you vote to close your community school? Would you vote to give the board the power to close your community school? Kind of get a temperature check on, I don't know how to articulate this, on the board's ability as it stands right now to vote to repurpose a community school which we do not need the town to vote on. And then also the temperature for paying a much higher, um, high, much higher taxes, given that we exceed the spending threshold. Eric, can I add on to that? And also uh, programming. Um, I remember Andrew framing is like sort of three legs of the, of the stool, um, schools and sort of that list underneath schools is Close schools, repurpose schools, uh, um, programs, just just straight people, and then taxes. That's Andrew. If I'm rephrasing that correctly, that's that's how we had mentioned. You had mentioned. Yeah, and as Ian was talking, I was thinking about all the great graphics that could be done around that triangle, where you know, presenting the problem to the community, which is affordability, staffing, and schools, and you would love to have all three but the projections say you can only have two. And we need to hear from you, which two corners of the triangle are you gonna pick? And here's the problem is if we pick this corner over this corner or this corner over this corner, right? And like a bunch of people's all lined up and they're starting to disappear. But yes, essentially programming, buildings or affordability. I would just offer one clarity there that programming as you just stated, to me is preferable over staffing because again, there is no censure sure. that keeps staffing, I don't think. Unless, unless it's the tax scenario. If spending is not an issue, then keeping staffing is possible. But program, I think, is better than staffing. Go ahead, Nancy. I, I just, um, the problem, I understand, I understand why not staffing, but the, but programming is too big for people to get their arms around. Um, most people, I think, who aren't, most people don't realize that that runs the gamut from football to chemistry, from, from, uh, from, uh, from instructional coaches to classroom. I mean, it's programming is, no one will know what that means or they'll make decisions about it based on what they think it means. So, I mean, I don't, I don't know how to break it down in a better way so that people will understand what that means, but programming isn't, is too broad, I guess is what I'm saying. Mary, I saw your hand up before. It's just the same question that I don't know how we're addressing the values like you where are we bringing the values that the community articulated into the conversation as part of the vision and I do think we should think about how we can frame it as a vision for the community rather than this is what's got to be cut this is what's, you know like I think it should really be vision based and not deficit based and using and by saying this is what we could do for i mean I'm just, I, it's so dark in my house right now i can't really see but you know if we took each of the 10 values and said here's what we could do for you know personalized learning plan we could hire two people if we close the you know like i don't even know if we could figure out some way of saying that does that make sense and then we were saying like just, yeah we're gonna we're gonna draw out the values for we're gonna see what the priority of the values i don't know where that's coming into the conversation or our community engagement. Yeah, I, I think it's critical that we bring the values into the conversation because we did a lot of work there and that's, that's a way to say, this is what we heard from you is important. What unfortunately I feel like is missing is that priority. 
because we we can't do all of those. I don't believe there's there's a path that achieves all of those well, but we don't so, know what to choose because we don't know how the community prioritizes them. Right on. So is that the could that be the entrance point to our communication with the community? Like because then it's not deficit based. It's like, hey, which one of these and what could we envision for, you know, if we really believed in social emotional learning, what does that look like? And would we want, would we need to, I don't know, that way we're asking people to think not deficit, not like, what are we losing, you know? And, and kind of gets me back to what I was wondering about earlier. Obviously, like these conversations, you know, tomorrow's too late to start the conversations, but at the same time, um, the re, you know, re-engaging with folks, I think, um, should be mindful and deliberative in how we, and how we begin the conversation again. And so I'm, I'm, I'm feeling like there's a lot of ways to do that and a lot of tools to do that. I love the interactive video component. I think the sooner the better, but I, I do think it, it might behoove us to, to not lead with that, to maybe lead with, uh, you know, re revisiting those values again and reconnecting with people around that um, before we start giving them tons of info. And that's kind and of, I think, one thing yeah. we learned from mm -hmm. our work with Sue is, um, and that's a dance and that's a time, more time consuming dance that we have to take, but I think it's important. Um, so maybe we move a little more quickly. Maybe we do that the week of September 14th. I don't want to drag this out longer than it needs to be, but that was kind of my, my question before, you know, maybe we start the work on these videos, but that's very um, one way information sharing. That's really important, but it's equally important to provide opportunities for for feedback. Um, and since we have not really connected with folks in a while, I'd rather lead with that if we can figure out a way. Well, so there's a bit of a natural um, transition because, okay, we, we got information from the community and we had this study done. So now we want to share some of the information from this study and how that now informs our thoughts or decision making process. I mean, is, does that make sense or? Because it does, people, but it's not, it doesn't give an opportunity to take the pulse again before we start. Well, I think, I think what a lot of feedback I got, at least from the Moncton um, folks who participated in the process last time was when it was over, they said, well, why didn't you just give us all those numbers in the first place? Why did we do all this? And I know that Sue, wanted to build community and, and says that that's the best way to do it. But um, a lot of people were like, oh, if I had known that at the beginning, I would have had different things to say at the original meeting. And right. so I feel like, was that useful or not? For me, so for, we, anyway, sorry, go ahead. That, that's it. I was just going to say, I think we can do both in this first contact, which is to say, we're reaching back out, we want to revisit these values, here's why, you know, here's a little bit about why we're in the place we're in, and we're going to, and you're going to be hearing more from us, dot, 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 you know, and then the dot, dot, dot is insert cool video, you know, articles in the paper, whatever it is we decide, because um, I agree, we need to provide some context for folks. I'm just struggling with, I don't, I'm concerned if we provide that context without any opportunity for input at the beginning, then we're... What kind of input are you looking for? Revisiting the values and getting people to prioritize so that we can know if they still hold true for people, given that a lot has happened since we last asked them. And so, but we can't redo that whole process, which took months, right? No, so, but I'm, I'm not suggesting again, that. Right. I'm oh, no, I know. I know. But so how would we do that in a short period of time? Um, again, with people maybe feeling, I don't know. Anyway, it is, it's tricky. It's tricky and we don't have much time and people are very consumed, at least parents are with 
the next month of school, right? So um, it's a tough time to insert stuff, but we have to. Uh, you know, I, I think we should go ahead with the, the assumption that those community values still hold, um, even though even though COVID is has you know upset a lot of things. Um, you, the values are they're pretty deep seated. They're they're not really situational as much as they are how people feel about the communities and how people feel about. Um, the importance of the so you, you know the social well-being of their kids um, you know the, those are the kinds of values that sort of supersede any setbacks that we might have um, and are, have been having and uh, you know we don't really have time to get feedback before if, if the goal is to have a straw vote at the end of October my concern is that the straw vote is only going to be as good as the number of people that participate. Um, and you, we're going to have to do a really good job to get people to participate in that. Um, and it, it, otherwise, you're getting the same people that are always participating and always involved. So, and, and how much weight is going to be put into that straw poll? straw poll is that going to be used as a basis for what's going to the board is going to recommend so uh, you know i'm not i guess i'm not second guessing the process but i'm just saying um you know to put a huge amount of weight into the straw poll and only get 15 percent of people in the community to respond to that is that really a good indicator of how the communities feel so i I, I don't know. That's just that's feedback from from what I've seen over the years and and the struggle that we have to get people to get involved and 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 give us input. I think the reason for the values is not that we don't all agree the 10 are important. I think what Patrick was saying in order to express a vision to people. So it's not like, hey, closing schools, period. It's more like, hey, we, we will have to do this because that's the fact of the matter, you know, but here's what we can do with the savings. We can, you know, get more, you know, blah, 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 whatever it would be according to these values. So we would get the prioritization from the communities like, oh, we believe in these top three, and then we can present a vision that responds to those top three values. I think that's that's what I'm hearing, why we would revisit the values. And it seems like if we jump right to the straw poll, it's like those those questions are so like, okay, do you want to close your schools? No. You know, like people are, it's like, that's not, we can't, we don't do that because you're going to get back into a hole of people saying they don't want to close schools and that kind of thing. I don't know. It seems like if we jump to the straw poll without engaging the values, it's going to be just like, why did we even do any of that? Yeah. All right. Can't you, can't you, you have the values that were pulled from the information collected. Can't you just state the values and then go into the poll? Essentially, you're just, aren't you just reminding people of, of what's happened previously and what, what came out of all those discussions? And then now you're sort of getting into the nitty gritty of what, of what the reality is. I wonder too, what, what's the role of the board in this, right? So the board acts as the informed agent of the ownership, which is the community. And the board understandably has more information than we can pretend the community is ever going to get before they go take a straw poll or go to the polls because the board's doing is engaged in this work regularly. Uh, many have been doing so for years. Is it, I guess I'm curious what the thinking is if the board took the task of prioritizing the values the community established as the informed agent of the community, um, if that's a way to get the clarity we're seeking um, and acknowledging the values the community has said that it holds. Go ahead, Ron. Um, I, I, as, as a new Lincoln resident and a new board member, um, still within my first year, 
Uh, Patrick, I honestly don't feel like I have a great sense of what this community, and I don't mean just Lincoln, I mean the five towns in general, what this community would value over thinking about schools versus programming versus taxes. Um, I honestly, in good faith as a board member, would have to abstain from that conversation because I, I honestly don't feel like I have a good sense of of the winds of the 10,000 people that live in this community. And, and that's why I, I wanna know what, what people think. Um, and we might get a third here, a third there, and a third there, and that doesn't lead us really anywhere, but I'd feel better um, late November uh, having an opinion. I feel I understand where people are at in the community that we all represent and, and do this work for. That's so so, I, so I, I appreciate that. And I've lived in my community for about 22 years. I don't know, I'm, I can't ever remember. And I've been on the board for nine years. And I would say that taxes and programming, there's different constituencies of, of who, what's important to who. But I think that especially with COVID, taxes are even more important to, to people and maybe important to people that they didn't used to be important to. And that programming is really important for parents of kids in the school and maybe other people. Um, and then, you know, I don't know where keeping schools open is because we've never asked that question before. But, um, but I would say that um, it probably depends on the communities that we're asking to close their schools too, right? So. Um, Anyway, but I mean, taxes have always been very, very important. And I think this board has always been fairly conservative in acknowledging that and, and, and doing that for the community. So anyway. John, did I see your hand up before? I, I did put it up. I, I was thinking about this discussion. The, this would be really relevant to, to, to the entire board the values discussion, because that's really our, the, the piece of our work. And I was, I was thinking, as I was listening to everybody talk, I was thinking about this really is a, should be a, at the board table for the entire board to be having a discussion and looking at the ends that are, we have. And there's other pieces of information that we can have look at. I'm Krista, I'm sure you're remembering the uh, strategic plan work, that information was gathered. So I was just thinking about all that, that had values in it. That this is a value, the, the work this committee did is the values. And I was just thinking as I was saying, really feels like this should be a board discussion at, it, at our table. Oops. So I'm looking at the time and trying to figure out how we move this piece forward. And I'm wondering if people think, um, again, that uh, I don't want to create subcommittees of committees of committees, but to, to look at this first communication to go out I think we have a pretty good idea of content. We're still sort of struggling with this, this values piece, but what if a smaller group of folks got together, chewed on some ideas and, and um, I'm, I'm wondering, Don, based on what you said, if we make that, bring it back to this group and make that recommendation to the full board. I mean, this group is gonna meet again, September 14th. Um, the hope is to get, you know, these, communication out sooner rather than later. The board then meets the week after that, I'm assuming. Is that right, the 21st? It's 22nd, but yeah. 22nd. Um, so is that too late to start putting it out? Um, I think the term work group comes to mind. Might be better than subcommittee of a subcommittee. Uh -huh. um, yeah. And there, 
I'm sensing two sort of action items that maybe even two different work groups could um, could sort of organize around. One is, what are we doing about these values that aren't currently prioritized? And the other is telling our story, like writing that narrative. Like that, to me, the narrative, getting started on writing our story in preparation for the work that's going to happen. Like, I'm, I'm curious to hear Ian's thoughts on, okay, so we've written our story. It, I'm assuming the day after we write our story, we don't have our videos all created, ready to roll out. Like there's a process that's going to take some time. I don't know what that window is, but I feel a sense of urgency if we're going that direction to get started telling our story. So those are, those are two action items that I think um, have kind of surfaced through this conversation. Can I just clarify what we mean by the story? Do we mean this? Do we mean like where we're at right now? Like budget wise? Is that the story we're talking about? We're not talking about like what we what we could do. Da, da, da. We're not talking about that. We're just like, hey, here's the deal. This is the gig. We don't have any money. Is that is that essentially the story? Not the story I want to tell. That's <laughs> Right? But that's not oh, the it's story. kind of the story, but yeah. So what is the, I mean, just give me ballpark story. Well, I'm thinking about the story. I'm thinking about there's a historical context. That's important. I think talking about the work the board has done to engage the community and the work this group has done, walking us up to the point where we are, we have this really, you know, challenging financial times. And that means we have to make some hard decisions, but you know, whether we use this phrase or not, but you know, we have an opportunity to, to be the architects of our future and here are the possibilities um, and it won't be easy, et cetera, like sort of a, a mix okay. of historical, current practical realities and the possibilities going forward is the gist of the story um, as I'm thinking of it. And obviously there are a lot of different perspectives that, that could be taken on our story, but that's where my mind went. Go ahead, Kim. Um, I'd be happy to, to help um, with the process on, on the work group in terms of telling the story, if Ian would be willing to be part of that um, in terms of helping to, helping to um, sort of sophisticate the, the telling of it in a way that can appeal to our five towns. Um, and it could be a series. The story might need to be told in a series of two or three different um, applications because it's an awful lot for people to try to absorb all at once. So um, I think the writing of the script, that that piece has to come from people who are on the board that have a better understanding of the report and what the board has decided and what the goal is in terms of the straw poll, like that, that piece, um, I feel like there's other information and there are, have some, have, there's been some decisions made about how this process is going to go that's going to have to be included in the writing of that story. So um, I'm, I'm happy to help collect the information and, and finesse it and distribute it, um, but I think the actual writing of it will have to come from, from a board member um, or, yeah, or somebody that's got a better idea of, of uh, where we are. I, I would be willing to be a part of that too. I think it's important to have um, some board members who have been on for a while. I don't know if Dawn would be, I know she's very busy. But, um, or, or, I mean, as we're doing it, we can push it back to other people too. It's not like it's an insular process. We could say we can run it by people and, um, and see if people think there should be things added or subtracted. So it's not like it's only going to be, I don't think it should be a few people because the board can't act that way. So I think anything we come up with, um, we should run it by other people too. I feel like there's one other work group that we haven't talked a whole lot about, but is an important one given the what the board came up with at the retreat, and that's a straw poll survey, whatever we want to call it, action group. There's some work around 
really designing that and, and getting something ready to send out in October. I would be totally part of that working group. That's the values that that one, not the story, figuring out how to get feedback about the values, prioritizing the values. I'd be happy to do that working group. I can help with the values too. The joy of being 20 years almost in this organization. <laughs> and Patrick, I think, were you putting, oh, sorry folks, I just wanted to clarify, Patrick, were you putting up a third group with the survey? Yeah, just again, reflecting on the conversation, I feel like we, we have to write the narrative for the story. We have to figure out what are we doing with these values, and we have to figure out what's this straw poll going to look like. Sorry, I saw your hand up, Rob, and Ian. Yeah, sorry, I, I, I had to step away for a second, but I missed what part of the what working group. I, I just want to volunteer for being part of the, the straw poll that I think is actually the, maybe the meat and potatoes of the more hard, I guess, harder numbers regarding uh, informing the board what the community wants to do. My my wife, who writes surveys for a living, um, would say she said she'd help us in, in crafting something like if it's going to be online and if it's going to be in paper, finding synergy between those two. So that I think that's really important that we have really good data not a survey that says, is this enough? Is it not enough? Okay. Uh, that doesn't truly inform us. And, and to get the most objective information um, as possible. And so I'm, I, whatever work group that is, um, you have a backlink of denials uh, on that. Thank you. Ian? Um, I was going to say in terms of the, the story idea in the video. So um, Patrick's right. You want to have uh, separate videos, depending on what you're what you're doing. Um, and so you could, I think, if you write something that encapsulates sort of the history, what's been happening, the hi bigger history, what's been happening in the last few years, leading all the way up. I think it might be too long. Think about when, you, if you're writing your script, all you need to do is just essentially find yourself reading it and speak at a fairly decent, you know, a normal pace and then see how long that's going to be. And then when you click that stopwatch off, that's how long your video is. I mean, maybe add another 10 seconds either side. And so if you, if you write that first script and you're up to five or six minutes, you've already lost people. You know, the majority of stuff that we do, it's a 30 second thing. Not that, not that that will, this, that will work for this situation, but as you get into one or two minutes, you're going to start to lose people. Um, and so depending on the, on the context of the video, of course. So just be mindful of that. And so if you, if, as you start to work on the story and, and creating that script, you know, be aware of, of that timing and what it might be in it. And, you know, then Ray and I can look at it and sort of, if you, if you create that and also have, as you create the story, I should say, and creating that script have, if you can have visuals in mind, you know, because that helps us too, especially in terms of timing. You know, oftentimes when we work with book publishers, because they're working with a marketing team, they are, they've already created a script. They know they've worked with the author. They know they want to hit these particular points. They're telling the story about the characters in the book. And so they have a script that they give to us. We make little tweaks here and there in terms of what's going to fit. And as we time it out, it's very quick. We can do with a, within a week, we can get like a first pass. And it, a lot of it is just sort of, you know, putting some music in, putting some temporary imagery in or using, you know, we often use imagery from the books and just be able to get no animation, but just being able to get that pacing and that timing for that particular story that you're telling. Um, and we would do the same thing here. So if you can, you're able to, to write a piece and say, here, here's the first draft of what we're thinking. We can time it out and, you know, fairly quickly get something back to you to sort of review. And then you can have, get a feeling too as well, how that's going to play and how you're feeling as you listen to this and as you're seeing those visuals. So I think, you know, so be aware of that timing, you know, as you write something, read it out loud at uh, a fairly normal pace and then, and then you can see where you're at. Um, and if you start, if you think that it's quite long, maybe then start to look at how you might break that up 
into each, you know, telling sections of that story through videos. So I, I'd be happy to project manage this, this whole thing, if that's helpful, I, you know, to, to work with whoever's going to write or help write um, with someone the script, um, get it to Ian. Um, Ian, do you, you actually need the voiceover to start the graphic or, or just the script? No, we can, if you just give us the script, we'll, we'll just do a temp track and we can, and we'll, we'll cut to that okay. and we'll start putting stuff to that. You know, having imagery or having an idea of what you might like to see as things are being discussed is always helpful because that's just quicker for us as opposed to us sourcing or, or sort of figuring out ourselves what we might want to see here. Um, you know, you having having that imagery there and saying like, oh, a shot of the school here would be great, shot of this here would be great, shot of this here would be great, or here's a folder of imagery that you might use. We'd like to see a graph here. I, I think, you know, obviously you folks and the board have a lot more insight of what might, might what you might want to see in the video you know, give us as much as you can, and then we can work to that. Okay. So it probably makes sense for Patrick to be pretty involved in that, right? So, and, and if not the yes. point person, so, um, what, what and, I was, and to be, yeah. Go ahead, Kristen, sorry. No, and so, um, so that group getting together at some point and just throwing out ideas and then but with Patrick being a very important person on that. And I had a journalism minor, so I can write. <laughs> anyway. I'm curious, yeah, I'm curious to talk through that process again, because time is of the essence. Um, I've often found somebody taking a stab at a draft of something to get reactions to is a good, play, good way to get something jump started, as opposed to trying to create it from scratch together. So I don't know if, who it makes sense to be the person that takes the first stab at it. I'm happy to do that. I wasn't a journalist major, um, a journalism major, so <laughs> it will sound different, but, um, but I'm happy to do that. But I'm also happy if somebody else wants to take a stab at it, but I just think somebody jumpstarting it with a draft would help. I think it makes sense for you to do that. If you don't amongst, I mean, this is a horrible two weeks for you to have to do anything, but um, I mean, it, it certainly makes sense. I think for you to do the first, and then we can all just like get out note cards and throw them around or whatever. Patrick, you have so much going on. I, I think I have enough information. Why don't I, why don't I take a stab at it? Um, send it to you. You can take a look at it and then, you know, put your voice on it. Um, you know, whatever I'm not getting right. I just feel like, I, I just feel like you're probably being split in about a million could, different Kim, could right we now. do that together? Having, being, being on the board, could a board person and a community member do that together? Cause yeah, I think, I think, I think, I, think I have hard. a lot of historical stuff and everything that might help. Okay. Does and that make maybe sense? Maybe you could take, yeah, or maybe you could take a stab at it and then send it to me since you've got the background and then I can just um, maybe finesse it a little bit around from a community member standpoint and mm -hmm. then we'll send it to Patrick. How does okay, that Okay, sure. Okay. Is that Great. okay, Patrick? And, and then Patrick could completely burn it down and redo it. That's fine. But no, we, no, no we go. He's getting something out there. I feel like my role no, would be, assuming I'm going to do the voiceover, which I'm happy to do, my role would be to, uh, I think as Kim mentioned, to, to get my voice in there so that it sounds like me when I'm the one talking, which I think will come across better. Um, but I'm totally happy with that process. I think that's fine. And Kim, I think we could do that together. I mean, I, in, in a way too. So um, why, don't, why don't we both do it and then see what we have and then, and then take it from there? Does that make sense? Because you would have a different perspective, especially on the work that's been done. I mean, do you want to, do you want to do it that way, or what do you think? Yeah, I mean, we can talk saying, about that later too. There's a saying: "Design by committee just never goes very well." Um, so uh, my my suggestion would be for for one of us to take that lead. Why don't I do a timeline and the process, and I'll send it to to everybody. If you take a stab, Kristen, just on the history, just sort of historically how, uh, how we got there. And then 
maybe um, maybe we can look at the rollout of this whole thing, and that's something that I can um, help in terms of how we communicate with the community, um, front porch forum, and you know I know that that you've got a pretty good system with the back to school um, communication channel right now. But then, so Ian has a good idea of what, you know, what we're looking at and to see, make sure it's manageable on your end and that from a time perspective that if we wanted to do two or three videos between now and the end of October, if that's realistic or maybe we can only do two or maybe we could do four, you, you know, just what makes the most sense um, uh, given what we come up with with this first one and how how much more we need to tell the story really well. Does that sound all right? So it sounds like we have work on this front that's already kind of starting, which is great. And then we have, um, sounds like Mary and Don said they would have some conversations about the values piece. And then Rob, um, I would just start thinking more specifically about the straw poll. So I'm going to um, maybe ask that we we all regroup on the 14th after this. These folks have had a chance to chew on this a little bit more, um, and maybe Rob, I'll help you on the straw poll piece if you're the Lone Ranger there, so you're not doing that on your own. Uh, and, and I think we have. As oh, folks are doing, so each of these three uh, sort of work groups are are taking shape yes there's a lot going on but this is also really important like i i I'll need to move into the crisis room and that's reality um but in the grand scheme of things this work is actually more important uh for our future so i, I don't want to disregard the my role in that and my support so just any action group that wants to reach out to me for help please feel free to do so and if, if I could add, um, Kim, the way that the board works is no one does anything by themselves. That's part of the essence of the board. So when I write something up, I'd like, I want to ask Andrew if I could run it by him because he might have some great stuff to add. And I, I might um, run it by Sarah also, who I know has left. Would that be okay, Andrew, if I, because I, I don't, I mean, I think that's part of what the board does is it works together. So um, I don't think the story can be told by any one board member at all. So just even for the rough draft, Andrew, would that be okay if I ran something by you like on Monday or something? Because I could be completely off and you, he has always has great ideas, Sarah does. So I'm sure she wouldn't mind. It shouldn't, it wouldn't take a long time. So thank you for, thank you. Okay, and, Krista, and Krista, you also, I mean, you have done this whole thing. So um, I'll just, and, and I'll send it to Kim too. So, because I, I think, um, I think, things like that can be built from pe different people's ideas. So I think that's okay. Okay, and I'll do a timeline so everybody knows what to expect by when and um, just kind of make sure that we, we stick to the timeline and can get it to Ian in time for us to reach our September 21st date. So Ian, I think that's a missing piece to this puzzle. When do you need a script by to, have, to be able to produce something? I guess, what do you need and when do you need it by to to be able to start rolling some videos out. I think that's, and maybe that's the timeline you're, you're referring to, Kim. Maybe you'll be talking with Ian more to do that, but. I think I heard him say a week. Did you say It'll that? It'll be a week if we, yeah, if you get us a script within a week, we can get you a very simple uh, video that you can look at. And it would just, it, you know, a lot of it might just be, you know, insert image here but at least it's sort of timed out and it's a piece that you can watch and we put some music to it and, and try to get a good timing where you're, where you at least hopefully can understand what's being said in the script. Um, but yeah, it usually takes us a week and we, we would have some temporary imagery in there depending on what you had. Um, but, so it doesn't take that long, especially if it's just a very rough draft that we can throw back and people can react to and, and look at that and say like, Oh, I don't want to image or I, I know it needs to go here, things like that. So, and it, so do you, do you have a time of when you actually want to release this to the public? What's your, what would be your date for that? Because everything then. I think, I think we were shooting for September 21st that week. Okay, so it's, all right, so that's three weeks essentially. Um, and maybe so, we could yeah, have something for the, the 14th meeting, just a really rough 
a, you know, to give everybody an idea of the direction. Yeah. Uh, and then yeah, I think so. between the 14th and the 21st, just tighten everything up and, and Patrick yeah. could do his voiceover if we don't have that by then and, um, and then get it out for the 21st. Okay. Yeah, no, that's, that's definitely doable. And again, as I okay, said before, great. like script and then any of the imagery that, that you want to go along with that script, even if it's just ideas or concepts or just like maybe put this in, like send us all that because then if we have a folder of material that we can pull from, we can start putting that in uh, and figuring out how that fits into the narrative. And Krista, you might have been saying this earlier and I'm just kind of cluing into it now, but I think what's happening is each of these um, work groups is going to come up with a draft something, draft script, draft plan for the values, draft survey slash straw poll, and we're going to bring those back and react to them as a group when we come together next time. Is that what I think I'm hearing? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. And I'm going to probably just float amongst the groups <laughs> and keep the ducks in the row in a row and make sure, you know, everybody knows what we're doing, but that's awesome. So we have some movement. Whew. Um, okay. So it's nine o'clock. I just want to take a quick pulse um because there's a lot to digest so anybody have anything they want to share before we close about any of them things we talked about tonight i just want to say i feel a little bit of a weight off my shoulder that we have some action steps this has been weighing on me for a little bit and i've been trying to articulate the urgency and we're moving and that feels good And I just want to thank Ian for his generosity in terms of uh, being willing to to help us get this into a visual format, and uh, that's huge. So thank you for that. Sure, my pleasure. I I have a question, but I'll ask it at the end. It's completely unrelated to this, but it's it's related to technology um, and something that the town is is working on. So when everyone's done with their questions. I just had a quick thing. Liz, I know you're typing. We're hoping to type, trying to type. I don't, we haven't heard much from you, so I just want to check in. Um, I think I, I would be happy to work with the values group with Don and Mary. That sounds good. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, so Ian, you had a question. Um, why don't you go ahead? So my question, so at the last select board meeting, they, uh, I agreed, the town agreed to be part of a, a CUD that the Addison County um, Regional Planning is putting together, which is an Addison County Communications Union District and I'm the representative, and this is to do with getting broadband uh, to all towns in Addison County. And, you know, we're lucky, I'm right in town on Mountain Terrace, and I have a fairly stable connection. I have like a 40 megabit connection and a 10 megabit up. And I'm just curious, the reason I thought about this as this meeting was going on, there's often times where it says, your internet connection is stable, and, and we're, there's a lot of fluctuation and in and out of quality for all of you. And I was just curious if anyone here knows what their internet connection is and I, and I just want to get a sense in terms of like I know in the village that Waitsfield Telecom are putting fiber in and so at some point within the next few months I'll probably be able to get fiber to my house uh, as will a lot of people in the village that it sort of discounts everyone outside the village because of the expense but the idea with this communications district is that you would they would work and it's via grants not taxpayer money to build infrastructure into areas that are that are underserved especially uh areas and it you may not get fiber but you'd get something maybe much quicker so i wanted to get like a, a quick question for the people who had i know that certain people live at certain distances away just what are most people outside of the village and are most people's connections fairly slow or is it a mix or i just wanted to get an, an idea just to, as i start to think about this particular uh, uh district 
So I live in Lincoln, uh, just off of Downingsville Road, sort of the northern, northeastern portion of Lincoln. Um, I have on a good day, 20 up and I think, or sorry, 20 down and I think three up. Um, it's often not quite that. And I actually inquired with Comcast. I am 0.67 miles from the Comcast line. I inquired what it would cost to run the line to my house, and it was about $14,000. <laughs> so you're on, you're on DSL now then, right? Yes. So it's through Waitsfield Champlain. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Okay. We have almost, we're in New Haven um, and we're, we are point, I think five, six miles from the, um, from the connect, from the place we need to be to get, um, there's some copper wire that Waitsfield Telecom can run to give you better, but we can't because we're just, we're just too, you know, this much too far. So yeah. we have a booster in ours and it's terrible. Uh, you know, we had four of us working at home this summer and it, we had to we had to mark off times on the calendar so people could have un uninterrupted um, you know, connection. Yeah. So not good. And that's Green Mountain, so. I'll also put out there that we don't have cell service. So I need Wi-Fi calling to make phone calls. <laughs> so when I don't have internet, I don't have phone calling. Which is tricky on snow days when I've got to figure out what we're doing. <laughs> All right. Nancy. I'm um I live on the on the border of Buell's Gore and Huntington. And yeah. it happens to be a place where Waitsfield Telecom laid a fiber optic cable some years ago. So I have fiber to the house. And I on uh, depending on who's doing what, right. I run from on download um, between 50 to 150 mega, megabits, megabits per second. And about from uh, 50 to 100 upload. So one of the things that our broadband task force has talked about um, is that it's not only, it's not just how you're rated, depending on what you've got and what you're paying for, but also what you typically get when you have a typical day of doing what what's happening in your house and how many people are doing it but also it's a reliability question um that is uh i may you know uh, i may have uh, 50 megabits per second but if um if i only have that sporadically that it doesn't help me that much i i would say that the department of public service considers you underserved if you have less than 25 down and three up so I think, you know, we're rural people. A lot of rural people are just so happy that they have anything that when we ask them, do you have enough? They, they, they say it's okay. But um, compared to what we ought to have, uh, us, us rural folks, um, we, lots, lots of people in our school district have our way underserved. So I'm very hopeful that the communications union district is going to be able to pull a, a substantial funds together to do some serious building um, very soon. So I'm in Moncton and Comcast is right here. It, it came with the house, we're very fortunate. It's partly why we live here because we can run to Burlington and all that kind of stuff. But we were running five people on Zoom stuff at some points. We had to get some repeaters in the house or whatever you call them, but that worked okay because we had two kids at Mount Abe, a college student, and my husband and I both working and it worked. So um, we're, we're good. I don't know how you are, Don, on Mountain Road. Do you have Comcast? Actually, actually, after this little bit of COVID, we got fiber to the house because our DSL just could not cut it and I feel like tonight, tonight my son is gaming downstairs and I had to keep shutting on my video so I could hear what everybody was saying. So, and my husband's a geek and I don't remember what he said the speed was. Don't tell him. <laughs> yeah, well, if you have fiber, it's fast. But yeah, I mean, even with people on fast connections, it's still dropping out and you're still dro dropping. And so I'm curious 
it's it's a combination of like Nancy said that that the latency, the Zoom platform as well. Um, you know, there are a number of factors that are affecting all of us, even if we are on fast connections. And then of course, if you're not on a fast connection or a sporadic connection, then it's even worse. So yeah. Right. It wasn't okay. long, like, you know, a couple months ago we were on DSL and I was having all kinds of problems. Right. Yeah. One of the things, at least in terms of the Zoom, since it seems like that's what everyone's using now, including the town, is just simple things like, in, at least in my control panel under video, I've, I've unchecked enable HD. So I'm not sending high definition video. I figure people don't need to see me in all my glory. Uh, and so that seems to have helped quite a lot. So if people have that option in their computer, you could all do that because you're, you we're only little boxes anyway. And that's probably that saves if you have a limited connection that would help save uh, part of your bandwidth. Also too, just doing audio is a, is a good thing too. It cuts that down, but of course you, you lose the interactivity. So I'm hearing, what I'm hearing a lot is it's, it's that it's very random. And I think a lot of people outside of the village area, you know, some are lucky, but others, others, it's that, it's that distance, that last mile to try to get some sort of service that's, that's decent. I would also say, call me crazy, but um, in the 1930s, uh, there was a rural electrification project that was backed by the federal government because people realized that it wasn't fair if only city folks had electricity. <laughs> and uh, really, information is currency now, and um, it needs to be distributed fairly. So that's what we're trying to do. Thank you for doing that. All right, folks, thank you all for being here, for being present. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to adjourn now, but I just need a motion from a board member if there's nothing else. Um, so if I can get a motion to adjourn, that would be great. So moved, Rob. And a second. A second, Andrew. Okay, all those in favor of adjourning, please say aye. 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 Great. All right, thank you again, everyone, and we will be back here on the 14th. <laughs>